Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truin. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. The sound of you doing is music to our ears. Order on the Home Depot app and get convenient delivery so you don't have to stop doing when you need something. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. This week, we help a homeowner try to solve the problem of excessive crawl space moisture. It's a real common problem, but we have a few tips that'll make it a little less of a problem. Also, things to consider if you're about to remodel a bathroom and raised beds are so popular for growing flowers and vegetables, but you've got to have the right soil. We'll tell you the right combination. Also, tiny houses been around a while. There are some challenges if you have a tiny house. We found a homeowner that's dealing with one right now. Also, what's involved in installing a floor outlet in an existing slab? Joe, what about that simple solution? When assembling kit furniture and cabinets, you usually have to use a hex key wrench or an Allen wrench which is very tedious, so I have a simple solution on how to speed up that process. All right, this sounds great. Let's get started. Joe, I'll tell you, looking at some of the trends that are out there, yeah. not surprising that cause of the pandemic, and, you know, a lot of people I hear more and more, I ask them, hey, are, you know, are you back in the office now? And some of the management are saying, well, um, why don't y'all stay in your house for a little bit longer? Right. Things are working out pretty well. So that is spawning a big interest and a lot of activity in creating those home office spaces. Absolutely. In fact, I just heard recently that now that the pandemic has weakened in a lot a lot of parts of the country and people going back, states have lifted indoor mask mandates. Some people have the option of going back to the office, but they aren't. So it's starting to transition to has nothing to do with the pandemic. They're just set up at home. They work more efficiently. And sooner or later, you might see offices releasing some of their rents because they don't have to rent such big spaces or maybe two floors in an office building. Maybe they only need one floor if people are working from home. I've been working out of my house since like the mid 90s. Well, that's what I was going to say. I know that you have, and you probably have a few tips for people on how to make that work because I've heard people saying, well, I just stay in my pajamas all day long and I don't get anything (laughs) done. Other people talk about, no, I have to get up. I have to take the shower, put on my work clothes and go into my space. And they have that separate space. So what are some of the suggestions that you have for people that are trying to figure out how to be productive at home? Well, you do absolutely have to have a dedicated space. Putting a desk in your bedroom or in the living room, it just doesn't work. So you have to get a dedicated space. We had a small room that was basically a bedroom that was never really used as a bedroom. So I've created my office there. It's upstairs. It's away from everything. But as far as working your pajamas, I've worked in my pajamas all day several times. As long as you're working, who cares, right? I mean, I've always had deadlines. I'm always writing under deadlines. As long as I meet my deadline, they don't care what I'm wearing. So uh, I have had I have gone to sleep wearing the same clothes I woke up with only because I didn't bother changing. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people say, well, don't you watch TV and visit the refrigerator 20 times a day? It's like, no, you know, not any more than I ordinarily <laughs> would, you know, because, you know, I have a mortgage to pay like most people or rent or whatever you're doing. So I have bills. But yeah, you have to absolutely have a dedicated space and also dedicated phone lines and internet and whatever you need to do. Because you want to go in there, close the door and be completely separate. Because don't forget, during the summer, depending on your living situation, like in in our case, uh, my wife was a teacher. So she's usually around a lot more in the summer than she is the rest of the year. And when our kids were living home, of course, they were home. Uh So if you don't have a dedicated space, it can get pretty noisy and hectic if you don't have that space. Well, I can see where the Spider-Man pajamas would be a bit empowering. It is. To keep you really charged up and so forth. Maybe, you know, climbing the walls a little bit bit here and there, but uh, that's a good move and a good look for you. But that, of course, you know, when you're talking about, you know, getting rid of distractions, that's very important on any space that you're working around your home. And of course, proper lighting, proper color on the walls, uh, things set up very well. We've done a lot. Matter of fact, next week, uh, we are starting taping kind of a unique project where this house, the layout of this particular house is real conducive to putting a new wall up to create a 
um, little office area within the living space without it being awkward. But also we're going to put some mineral wool insulation inside that wall, and we're using a special national gypsum sound break drywall. Right, yeah, that's important. Right? So that we can really isolate that sound, you know, in there. And um, then we're uh, trying to look at different ways that we can uh, create an interesting background for the Zoom oh. calls, that's very important to have yes. something, you know, maybe a little pull down. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. We're, we're trying like a to palm figure tree and a beach. Yeah, a palm tree and a beach. Thing. There right. you go. Yeah, well, I'm in the middle of, in fact, this right after I get off the air, I'm going to be going down finishing building a desk, a stand up desk, because I'm moving my office from the room I'm in now into a space, a bonus space that I refinished a while ago. And what I did is I had two filing cabinets that wind up taking up a quite a bit of space. And in this room where I'm moving, there's a knee wall. And so I just cut holes in a knee wall and set these right in there. Mm -hmm. So they take up absolutely no floor space. That's That's the other thing, because usually home offices are relatively compact spaces, but you do still need, you know, a desk and maybe filing cabinets, bookshelves. So that's one way. I also built a little bookshelf into the knee wall. So that took between the bookshelf and the two filing cabinets. I'm not taking up any floor space at all. It's completely flush with the wall and, you know, frees up the space for my standing desk. And I think I'm going to get one of those tall office chairs with wheels mm-hmm. so yeah. someone can come and push me around that might be fun i know i know a lot of people that love the stand-up desk including oh, our yeah. uh, producer glenn johnson is standing up there all the time me too. walking around mm-hmm. a little bit here and there so uh, i know there's a lot of advantages to that but if you're doing a home office those are some of the things that you need to think about also a, a tremendous trend still outdoor living space people have been stuck at home and they realize hey i just got to get outside they're developing uh, different surfaces of course pavers are very popular different types of concrete and you know a lot of different ways you can go building decks if your yard is conducive for that so there's a lot of those spaces and then all the amenities that we're seeing there joe of course the the shade cloths the water features yep. wireless speakers that's something i think is just great that you can bring your speakers out even four of them and set them on the corners of your deck grab your phone and you got music instantly you can set four of them out says the man who has 12 speakers just in his shop (laughs) (laughs) it works great danny's a big fan of those wireless speakers i love the wireless speakers hey we're just getting started on today's homeowner give us a call 800-946-4420 or you can go to our website it's dayshomeowner.com slash ask to send us an email we love getting emails and if you've sent us an email this week get ready we're going to tackle as many of those as as we possibly can. Right now, we're going to try to help Janice out that has a little problem with some humidity. Janice, welcome to the show, and uh, tell us what's going on there. Hi. My problem is this. Uh, moisture and humidity is a real challenge here. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, are there any cost-efficient ways to reduce the moisture in the crawl space underneath my house? Okay. Well, I tell you, it is a, a common problem, and it's amazing how many issues can occur at your home when you have moisture under the house. There are several things that happen there. Sometimes just the natural groundwater is going to migrate up through into your home. Um, Other times, maybe there's a drainage issue that you might not even be aware of. A lot of times people are putting up these nice flower beds and so forth that actually end up damming up the rainwater and kind of encouraging it or routing it under the house. That's definitely something that you you don't want to do. So it might be something that, you know, next time it's raining, put on your rain gear and your umbrella and kind of look around at where that water is going when it's coming off your roof or through your downspouts of your guttering because you really want to encourage it to move away from the house. Also something that's not the most fun home improvement project, but certainly one that's very, very effective, and that's just laying down a piece of plastic right on the ground. You can just lay down any what we call six mil plastic, which indicates the thickness of the plastic readily available at the home center. Just lay it right on the ground, maybe put a little gravel around the perimeter or a few rocks or bricks there to keep it from blowing if you have it completely open. That will really kind of keep that moisture from migrating up into your house. Because when you have your air conditioning and heating system rolling along, it can pull up in through little cracks and crevices that you might not be aware of. Of course, that is probably the easiest and best way and inexpensive way to really help out on that excessive moisture that you might have. Okay. Well, that sounds like something worth trying. And uh, real quick, should it be the perimeter, should it be open or closed? I've heard both. Yeah. To tell you the truth, the more open and the more air you get under there, the better. Um, If it is closed in and you have the foundation vents, those foundation vents should stay open all the time. 
summer and winter to allow that breeze to move through. And oftentimes people will let their shrubs grow up a little bit too much and, you know, it blocks those vents. And unfortunately, a lot of times you simply don't have enough vents around the perimeter. So you'll want to make sure that you keep those open, keep the uh, the bushes trimmed back, put that plastic down, and that right away is going to improve your whole situation there considerably. But just make sure that none of the water or rainwater is finding its way under the house. That can be very problematic. Joe has some input for us as well. Yeah, Denise, the only other thing I would add is you can install an electric foundation vent that will blow air out. It basically looks like the vent you have, but it has a fan behind it. And also when you put down the plastic, what what is your crawl space? What are the walls made out of? Is it poured concrete or concrete block or what is it? Do you know? They're sitting up on cinder block, concrete cinder block. Okay. So is this an enclosed crawl space or is it up on piers? It's up on cinder block, about, I think, maybe two levels of cinder block. Okay. And then the house is bricked. Okay. So you want to, if, if it's a continuous crawl space wall, especially your cinder blocks, concrete blocks, you want to continue that plastic up onto that wall because moisture is also migrating through the walls, not only the floor. Okay. Don't extend it up onto the any of the wood framing. In fact, code typically requires to keep that a few inches short of the any wood framing at the bottom of the wall because you don't want to trap moisture there. But between an electric vent and putting down the plastic, as Danny said, especially on the floor and up the walls, tape it really well. That should seal out a lot of that moisture. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you both so much. You're welcome. Okay, our pleasure. Thanks for being a part of the Today's Home Water Radio Show today. Okay, have a good one. You know, Joe, that brings up the thing about encapsulation. Right. I was under a house recently that had, you know, a lot of problems with it. A buddy of mine that asked me to drop by and take a look at it. And, um, boy, it's amazing. You know, you have that encapsulation, which is thick plastic. It's sealed up all the way around the perimeter. They seal it up when it meets all of the piers. And then they have a dehumidifier in there. And we get a lot of, you know, questions about that as far as what are the pros and cons. Certainly, you know, one of the cons right off the bat is it can cost a lot of money, anywhere from $1,500 to $10,000 to encapsulate everything, depending on the particular way the structure is done. And, uh, of course, you do have a little maintenance there. And I've got to think that dehumidifier is going to contribute to a higher energy bill. You'd think it'd have to. Even though a lot of times they will say it actually saves energy by having this area you know, the moisture controlled in this area, much like you have, I guess, when you have the spray foam and your attic right. is, you know, semi air conditioned, maybe it's kind of the same way in saving money. So I'm not sure about that. But I mean, it's I think that's to me, it would only be something that you would do under an extreme conditions. What we've recommended to Janice will take care, I think, of the majority of problems without the encapsulation. Right. And when if you put in a dehumidifier, it's collecting the condensation out of the air and where's it going you know so you may have to get a dehumidifier that has a condensate pump in it to pump it up and out right yeah okay you know because it's going to be on a lower level well you don't want to be pumping it out like right out the foundation because of course it'll drain back in and you'll take it out of the air and pump it back you'd be recirculating that that what yeah, generally they'll have those those hoses going you know to the to the outside that you have to deal with that amount of moisture on the outside there of course it pretty much eliminates pests you know it, it's an environment that is not conducive for any type of you know roaches or wood destroying fungus or wood destroying insects like termites you know it pretty much eliminates that type of thing also i've seen people use it for storage whereas you might not put some things under the house um, you know ladders and a few things like that just because but if it's a nice controlled environment maybe you pick up a little bit more storage but i don't know it's always one of those things that when you're talking to somebody that sells encapsulation oh yeah they can have a pretty compelling yeah. argument as yeah. to why you have to have it but I think it's only in real extreme cases where uh, when 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 all else fails, then maybe you go to that route. Right. And a lot of people don't realize that high humidity attracts dust mites and they don't associate dust mites with the high humidity, but it attracts the dust mites. And if you have asthma, even mild asthma, you can really aggravate the problem. Hey, Danny, before we go to a break, I saw something and I thought of you. There was an ad I saw in a local uh, magazine. Uh, uh oh. Danny has a aquarium in his house and he was catching fish out back in the river and putting right. them in. Look at this. There's a company that's called Robo Koi. Huh. It's a remote control robotic koi fish. Needs no feeding. It's chlorine safe. Dozens of styles. Fade resistant colors because you don't want your koi, 
you know, fading. An easy way to enjoy the beauty of koi, and it says, and they never die. Oh. So you get remote-controlled koi for your pool, for your aquarium. I think your grandson, Gus, would love that. Well, while I'm sitting in here thinking about, you know, I've been wondering, what am I going to get Sharon for her birthday that's coming oh, up? Oh, what, what says I love you more than a robotic fish? Is it available in pink? If it's available in pink, <laughs> and maybe I could name it, go ahead and gave, give it a name ahead of time and really personalize that, that special gift. I think that would be, it's something she doesn't have. Oh, that's sweet. When That'll you hand it our... to her, though, be sure you run immediately out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> That'll strengthen our marriage even more. This is this is great. I appreciate Joe, sure. the marriage counselor. Ro- Robo Coy. <laughs> Robo Coy. That's pretty good. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. We'd love to get a question from you. You can send us one at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. This one came from James in Tennessee. We just bought a 1,200 square foot condo that was built in 2010. It has popcorn ceilings throughout, which are in perfectly good shape. I really don't mind the popcorn ceilings, but my wife hates them. So guess what? Can I remove the popcorn myself (laughs) or should I hire a contractor? And if I decide to hire someone, who would I even call? That's a good question, actually. Well, boy, oh boy, James, you've got something here that lots of people, I actually have a condo with popcorn ceilings and we were looking at them, uh, you know, should we go ahead and scrape them all down? And we decided not to because they were in such great shape. Uh, Someday we might do that, but wasn't any real reason to. But if you're under the mandate of needing to strip these down, you really need to go to our website. First of all, todayshomeowner.com. We have a lot of videos and we have a special formula that you can put in a pump-up sprayer, spray it on the ceiling and make it a lot easier. And and Joe, also, I found that the little tool from Homax. Oh yeah, the scraper. Yep. That has, uh, you know, you put the little garbage bag on it and has the scraper. And boy, that really minimizes, you know, the amount of popcorn that you end up in your hair. Because we've gotten a few (laughs) pictures from homeowners over the years that didn't know about this. And they looked a little like uh, there's snow on the roof. You know what I mean? You know, it looked a little bit like that. But the formula and more than anything, covering up everything. Yeah, you can get that really thin plastic and you point it on the floors and the walls. and, And it's not as difficult a job as you might think, but it is very, very messy. I mean, there's no other way to get it off, scraping it off. And the product Danny's talking about, I think it's just called the Textured Ceiling Scraper. And it's a 12-inch wide scraper that you can put on the end of a extension handle. And it has the steel blade for scraping, but around the blade is a rectangular metal frame. What you can do is you can clip on a plastic bag. Then as you're scraping, nearly all of it, it's surprising how mm-hmm. much it catches, but nearly all of this old popcorn will fall into the bag and what you're going to do is you're going to spray it on the ceiling so it's going to be kind of soggy but it catches it don't try to fill up the bag though because it might be too heavy but anyway you just scrape it and you'll capture if it's done correctly you can capture probably 90 95 percent of it and again the manufacturer is homax h-o-m-a-x and what you're going to spray it with before all this is a little fabric softener and some hot water Right? That's, That's the formula, right. Danny. Hottest water that you can get. Yeah. And let it sit. You know, you're going to have to wait for it to go. If, if it's been painted, if the ceiling's been painted, it might take a little longer for the hot water to soak through. But then scrape it. And the only thing I want to mention, James says this was built in, what do you say, 2010. So it's not right. an issue. Any popcorn prior to 1970 might contain asbestos. So you shouldn't be scraping it. You can take a little scrape a little and do a test kit on it to make sure it doesn't contain asbestos. If it does, then you have to call in a professional. Now, I'll tell you something from experience. If it has been painted before, mm, it's time yeah. to break out the dynamite. That's the only thing that will get that <laughs> off is just a good stick of dynamite because it really is hard to get it off of. I mean, not not to be too discouraging on that. It can happen, but just be prepared for a harder project uh, ahead on that. And no matter how careful you are, there's going to be a little drywall damage. So the thing to do is after you scrape it off and make sure things are, are as clean as you can possibly get it, including around the perimeter of the room, then let it dry. Maybe let it dry for a day, maybe add a little uh, fan action on it to dry it a little quicker, then come back with your joint compound in order to, you know, fix any little divots that you might have in it before you prime and paint the ceiling. But, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people are doing this. Thousands of people are doing it uh, very successfully. So, James, hopefully you can do that as well. Joe, you know, of course, um, you know, Armstrong has that ceiling. I know Dennis, our engineer, installed it. I mean, right, even yeah. he installed it. I mean, you, that shows you how simple it is. <laughs> wow. Um, and, 
is it still and, up though, or is it now an Armstrong floor? That's what we have yeah, to ask him. Yeah, I know it. I know it. So the but the ceiling can be you know, and then of course you can always use a quarter inch drywall and install over your existing. You know, you have to make sure that those fasteners do go into the ceiling joist, and then you have the finishing process, which uh, is not the easiest thing for you know some homeowners. But there are other alternatives than scraping it. But James, I would try scraping first before you go with anything else. Today's Homeowner is brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. And welcome back to the Today's Homeowner Radio Show, where it's time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. And one of the things that Joe hates about mopping is rinsing and wringing the mop. It's quite a hassle, and oh, it just seems like he just keeps using the same old dirty water to rinse it. But I'm about to change all of that. So O Cedar makes mopping a lot easier for Joe with their spin mop, and now they're improving it even more with this rinse clean bucket system. And here's how it works. It's a dual chamber bucket that separates the clean and dirty water into separate tanks. So you can continuously clean with clean water, and the triangular mop head allows for better corner cleaning, while the microfiber mop head removes up to 99% of bacteria with just water. Plus, there's a foot-activated spin ringer which allows Joe hands-free ringing and controlled water release so I guess Joe you're out of excuses for not mopping a little bit around the house you can find out more about this special thing Joe pay attention now I the O cedar rinse clean spin mop and bucket system you can find out all about it at homedepot.com I can see you now Joe with the little music in the background That's right, you're yeah. holding on to your mop you got your foot you're cranking that spinning ringer Oh man, Joe, it's 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 right around the corner, buddy. Foot activated spinning ringer. I need one of those on pretty much everything I own. That sounds pretty good. But it does. It's pretty interesting that they separate the dirty water from the clean water. I'm not even sure how they do that, but it'd be interesting to check that out. It's pretty cool. We did a best new product segment on oh, did you? television here recently about it and and I thought, "Wait a minute, a mop bucket? What 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 is that doing here?" But then again, problem solution. It's a great way to to, you know, to make things a little cleaner and certainly everybody's a lot more conscious about getting things clean around the home. That's right. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline, and we would encourage you to give us a call anytime, 800-946-4420. That's what Manny in Michigan did. Manny, tell us all about this uh, bathroom idea you have, and welcome to the show. Well, our shower is pretty small, and our bathtub is pretty large, and we take more showers than baths, and I wanted to get your input about flip-flopping the shower and the tub. So we could have more room when we take a shower. Are you still thinking about maintaining your tub? Uh, we're not sure. We're still up in the air. There is a second bathtub in the house, so getting rid of the tub is not out of the question. And and people are doing that all the time. Very common project to do there. You may even be able to eliminate the tub because you always want to have at least one tub in the house. But nowadays, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the master bath. So you could easily eliminate it, um, enlarge that shower considerably. You might even have a little bit of room left over there for a small linen closet or something else. But I'll tell you, the showers are getting bigger and bigger and uh, like I say, if you're using that more than you are, you are the tub, it, it does make a lot of sense. Now, let me ask you, are you, um, is this second floor or first floor? Second floor. Okay. So um, you would have access to the plumbing once you tear everything out by accessing through the subfloor. Then you can relocate all of that plumbing fairly easily. So uh, that's a very doable thing. Mm-hmm. The only thing about a project like that, it starts affecting potentially, of course, the walls, but also potentially the floor. You might have to look at the ceiling. So it ends up um, being a little bit more of a project sometimes when you think about all the other surfaces that it affects. Okay, that's good to know. But but very positive and also good for resale. People love to see the big showers in there, and uh, you might consider a little seat in there, and also the hand wand is something that a lot of people are doing. Oh, that's good to know. I Yeah, I will uh, definitely look at the seat, probably something in like a cedar or teak. Well, you could do that. I see a lot of the wood ones, but many times it's all you know encased with part of the materials that you use for the wall or the floor. 
Uh, it just has to be done by somebody that really knows what they're doing because you don't want any potential of any leak. And the um, the pan and the rubber membrane that's used under that is very, very key, you know, that it doesn't get, end up with a hole in any way. And uh, it could be a real successful project. But I would really look at uh, getting a pro that routinely does this kind of work, that you can go and look at some of the projects that they've done to make sure that it's the kind of project that you're expecting. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, I don't want to mess with the plumbing. Yeah, no, not at all. I wouldn't suggest that. But thank you. That's been a good advice. What else can we help you with? I, I do have one other question, if you have a moment. My bathroom door, when I open the door, the door swings open by itself. It won't stay partially open. So do I have a ghost in my house or just a bad door? Well, I tell you, that is a common problem. And, and we, we had a homeowner a while back tell us they got up in the middle of the night and ran smack into the door and had <laughs> oh. a, a pronounced thing right down the center of their forehead. But but um, Joe has an easy, easy solution to that that you can do right now. Go ahead, Joe. Well, you, you, Manny, you may have a ghost. I'm not sure. But there's a couple of ways <laughs> to do that. The, the, the simplest way, and this doesn't always work depending on the weight of the door and how much out of plumb it is, but you can take out a hinge pin one at a time and put it down on a, like a concrete surface and strike it with a hammer and put a little bit of a bend in it. Not much, just a little bit of a bend and tap it back into the hinge. What happens, it creates a little bit of friction so it might hold the door closed. I would certainly try that first. Uh, and the reason it swings open is typically when a door is installed, they just install the door jam flush with the wall without any consideration whether the wall is plumb or not. Plumb meaning perfectly vertical. It's, it's nice and flush with the wall surface, but if the wall's leaning in or out, of course the door is going to be swinging open or close on its own because it's not plumb. So, I mean, you could check that too. You can put a level on the door jam itself and see if it's out of, if it's out of plumb, then you can plumb that up, and that, of course, will make the door not swing on its own. Well, I guess that'll be my project this weekend, since we just got uh, about five, six inches of snow. Good. Yeah, <laughs> as long as it doesn't keep snowing. <laughs> That's right. Just stay with the inside like that, Manny, but that, that'll take care of that little solution, and, uh, and, and hopefully everything works out great with your bathroom. Thank you very we much We certainly appreciate you being a part of the show today. That's a great project, something very, very common, converting those um, bathtubs that you may just not use at all and put in a nice walk-in shower that has, you know, some anti-skid properties to it. That's one of the right. things that yep. you're seeing a lot with the different type of showers. And uh, also, you know, for those that have a little bit of challenge mobility-wise, that helps a lot instead of stepping over into a tub and shower, you're able to walk right in. Makes a big, big difference. Hey, want to make sure that you know how to get in touch with us. We make it so easy. First of all, if you like emailing, today's homeowner.com slash ask is where you can go to send us an email. If you want to give us a ring, we'd love to hear from you at 800 946 4420. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, we get a lot of calls there, and we want to get to some right now that have been some of the recorded calls we want to tackle. I was wondering if I could get a little help. I'm about to empty a raised bed and refill it with fresh soil. I'm curious to know what's the best combination of soils that I can put in that bed to get the nicest flower garden, keeping in mind that I am a senior citizen and getting uh, soil dropped off that I have to wheelbarrow to the backyard is not a possibility. All right. I'd appreciate an answer. Thank you very much. All righty. Well, Joe, you know I've got pretty enthusiastic about the raised beds that I have. Yes, very productive raised Man, beds, by the way. Yeah. I have. I did a lot of research on it because these are four fairly large raised beds and I knew it would take a lot of work, and I didn't want to do it more than once, and I think I hit a home run on this as, That's right. as much as I'm getting. Now, what I did here and what uh, the combination of soil that I used is 60% topsoil, and get the best. A lot of times it's referred to as sifted topsoil. There's no roots in it, and it is good stuff. 60% of it is that. 30% of it is compost. Now, I actually used, um, you know, bag compost, a very common one called black cow. 
and Black Cow is just phenomenal, and I used 30% of my mix with that, and then 10% potting soil, which is usually made up of peat moss, perlite, and vermiculite. It's more or less to kind of loosen up the soil so that it doesn't pack down, which is very important for, you know, to get the air and to encourage the root growth. So again, 60% topsoil, 30% compost, and 10% potting soil and uh, that takes care of it. Also, Joe, I've heard more and more about people talking about don't feel compelled, especially depending on how deep your raised beds are, don't feel compelled to fill every single bit of it up That's right. with yeah. soil. A lot of times you can put gravel or rocks or some other material um, in the bottom of it so that you don't have so much volume that you have to deal with. Yeah, because a lot of times you'll see they'll be 12 inches deep or deeper. And depending on what you're planting, you might only need four to six inches of root exactly. support. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can fill with any organic material. I mean, you can put um, wood chips, you know, um, mm -hmm. as long as it's not, you know, it's clean. Wood chips, uh, gravel, almost anything, fill it up. And at Home Depot recently, I saw a product. I'm not sure if this is a new product, Danny, or one I just hadn't seen before. It's from Miracle Grow, and it's called Expand and Grow. And mm -hmm. the grow is spelled without a W in case you're looking it up online. It's a potting mix, especially formulated for these types of planters, these raised beds. And it's 100% organic. And their claim is that it grows flowers and plants three times faster than normal potting wow. mixes. Because hmm. it's all organic. It has peat moss and bone meal and kelp and some sand and compost, which is most important. And so for someone who's struggling with how do I get it to the planters, well, here it comes in bags. You can probably get it delivered or get someone with a truck to pick it up and bring it and dump it right there, and you'd only be moving smaller bags. Right. The bags I saw probably weighed maybe 20 pounds or 30 pounds, something like that. So that's another way to get it there instead of getting you know a truck dumping three different loads and then shoveling it and mixing it. That might be easier for her. And on that 60% top, so a lot of times you can find landscapers that you know have small trailers to get it up really, really close because that's a lot of bags if you have a sizable amount. Dennis, some input? With potting soil, is there a different potting soil that if you're growing food <laughs> as opposed to ornamental flowers that would make a difference? You know, is it okay to use any potting soil if you're growing lettuce, et cetera? Sure. The, the pH level pretty much is the same, pretty much a neutral pH that, that they encourage that, a 7 or a little over 7 uh, for just about any of those. Now, some of the specialized flowers, I understand, do require a little more acidic soil. Um, so that is a valid thing, whether uh, the caller mentioned growing flowers. Right. And, of course, if you're growing vegetables, it may need a little bit. And also some of the, the fruits require a little more or acidic soil as well. So good question on that. I'm Danny Lifford along with my buddy Joe Truini. We want to hear from you. All you have to do is pick up the phone 800-946-4420 and you can also send us an email by going to todayshomeowner.com slash ask. Right now we're going to Portland, Oregon. Ryan is on the line. Ryan, welcome to the show. Anxious to hear about your, your tiny home. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. I just recently started listening to your show. Really appreciate all the uh, tips and tricks that you offer. Good, thank you. So about uh, in 2018, my wife and I decided we wanted to build a tiny house. So it's just over 200 square feet. Neither of us have any uh, previous experience building aside from small projects. But what we found out after living in it for a bit was that condensation was building up everywhere. And we are basically looking for a solution. You know, we lived in it for three years. We rent it out now to a friend, but we still have the condensation issue. And short of keeping a window open to sort of have some makeup air in there, um, just looking for a solution for a small space to uh, keep the mold and condensation down. Well, looking at some pictures, beautiful job on all of that. I just love the way it all looks. And from the outside, it looks pretty small. From the inside, it looks pretty spacious there. So you did a <laughs> a great job on that. And, and I noticed you have a, a mini split system. You have a system, air conditioning system, uh, that's very popular nowadays in the United States on the wall. So that, that just didn't pull the moisture out of the inside, apparently. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And underneath there where you have, I see you have some skirting around it and so forth. By chance, is there any plastic on the ground? Uh, there's not. Okay. Well, that'd be the first step because that moisture in that ground, especially if you have it closed in all the way around like that, 
that moisture, it's amazing how much moisture can migrate up out of the ground. That's one source of moisture there. So I would put just a piece of plastic, not not under, not nailed to the underside of the tiny home, but right on the ground and make sure that that's done. And um, also where that water runs off the back, I couldn't tell if there's a gutter there or not, but if that water's running off the back and possibly finding its way under the house, that can be another source of moisture. That moisture is going to find its way inside the house. So that alone may take care of it, but the whole thing with uh, condensation is moisture in the living area. Um, a little hygrometer will tell you just how bad it is, a little digital hygrometer. Uh, you always want to keep that down below 50%. And it might be that it's amazing in a, in a inside space if you use a small dehumidifier. And I'm talking about one. I, I have one in my production closet where we have all of our expensive cameras and such. Uh, it's only about a foot tall and about 10 inches wide. And it's amazing how it's brought our relative humidity down by about 10 or 15%. And that may be all that's necessary, and then you just have to empty the little canister about once a week. And uh, it's amazing what that can do to lower that the condensation problems in a home like this. Yeah, and actually, uh, we, we do have one of those that we've been utilizing, and it works pretty well. Um, but I did hear on one of your other uh, shows that uh, it's kind of a Band-Aid solution, and we're looking for something more long-term. So I'm still kind of exploring those options. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Well, I would certainly put that plastic under there and take care of it. Joe, any thoughts on uh, how we could help Ryan out with his condensation? Yeah, Ryan, actually, tiny homes have had a ongoing problem with condensation, which kind of makes sense because it's a lot easier to build a small building and make it airtight as opposed to a larger traditional size home, right? Because there's the larger home has more windows, more doors, more places, condensation get in and out. Sure. In your case, you know, it's such a small building, it doesn't take much to trap it. So biggest key is ventilation, anything you can do, whether it's a fan with a humistat on it that will just kick on when the humidity gets to a certain level. I mean, obviously just leaving a window open only works certain times of the year. But yeah, other than a dehumidifier, which again will require some maintenance because someone has to keep track of it. You don't want it overflowing unless you drain it outside. Um, but yeah, anything you do to keep water covering the ground with plastic will help prevent moisture from migrating up through the floor system and into the building. But other than just ventilating, there's really not much else you need to do. Okay. And are you guys by chance familiar with uh, ERVs or HRVs? Yeah, the heat recovery systems. Yeah, certainly. Boy, I saw a lot of those a week or so ago at the International Builder Show and the Kitchen and Bath Industry Show. They, they're they ramping those up more and more. And actually, I saw one that was made for small spaces. So that's definitely an option in being able to get that air exchange that's so important these days. Okay. I might have to go back online and uh, do a search for that. Yeah. Well, good, Ryan. Well, uh, again, fantastic job that you and your wife did on this wonderful little tiny home. And uh, best of luck to you on uh, finding out this problem. But I think start with that plastic, and that might be all you need. Great. Thanks, guys. Okay. Our pleasure. Yeah, that's uh, you're right, though, Joe. There is more of a issue there when you have those small, right. essentially one room, because any of your, your moisture and everything, if you're not getting that out of the house as soon as possible, it's going to cause those kind of issues there. They also don't typically have a traditional vent system of soffit vents and ridge vents because every square inch is living space. So they're not always vented as much as they should be. And I'm sure that's contributing to this problem. And we're having a lot of fun answering questions from people all over the country. And occasionally we have one of our friends on the phone with us. And this is a wonderful lady that we met through our television show, had a great time side by side with her putting together this beautiful shed that I'm sure she's creating some wonderful artwork in right now. Linda, welcome to the radio show. So glad to have you on. Hey, Danny, your number one fan in Fairhope. How are you doing today? <laughs> I, I, I'm doing great. I saw that you were on the list for today, and I'm so glad. we. I mean, you're always doing something. I mean, we thought that we would keep you busy with this art studio that we created for you, but now I hear you're moving inside. Uh, unfortunately, I heard you had a little damage inside. I did. I had a plumbing failure and uh, ruined my hardwood floors. Oh. So they can't be repaired. I'm having to replace them all. Mm. And um, the issue, I'm on a slab. I don't know if you remember, I have no crawl space. I'm uh -huh. on a slab, so I have concrete floors under the wood that they're pulling up. And I don't have a floor outlet in my living room and would love to add one or two of those but the issue is cutting the concrete, and it's inside, and I've seen 
when they saw concrete outside, I just cannot fathom the mess, the dust that that would make, and want to know if there's a less messy way to achieve that goal. All righty. Well, uh, I don't think I'm going to have a lot of good news for you on that. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, the inside of your house was just incredible. It was perfect. There didn't need to be anything. So I'm so sad to hear that you're having to go through uh, a pretty significant you know, remodeling project here because you're talking about a lot of movement of furniture. You can't do one room at a time. Uh, now, th- th- is this a, a pre-finished floor? That I'm installing, yes. Okay, okay. Well, that's that's a lot less messier than having to go through, um, you know, um, having to refinish an entire floor. Well, um, there are ways to keep the mess down to a minimum. You can, um, when someone, you know, because you do have to take a, a pretty aggressive saw, cut a notch about, you know, an inch wide, couple inches deep. Sometimes you could go on down through to the bottom of the slab. But cutting that out is a tremendously messy thing. You can put fans in there and blow the, the, to the outside as much as you can. You can minimize it, but it's still going to be quite a mess. But, um, you know, there's, there's not much other way. Joe, do you have any other thoughts on that? Because any of the little channels that go on top of the floor, right. it's just going to be a trip hazard and just not going to look right. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Linda, it, it, traditionally it's a pretty messy process. They often use a wet saw, which is a saw, a concrete saw that's hooked up to a hose and the water keeps the dust down. In fact, there's no dust. But what it does produce is lots of slurry, which is you know the really muddy cement that gets cut up by the saw. And so that keeps the dust down, but it does make a bit of a mess with all the slurry, but it doesn't get blown through the house. So that's one option. And there's a company called Hilti, H-I-L-T-I. They make industrial tools. And anybody that is doing this for a living can either, cutting concrete for a living, either owns this tool or could certainly rent it and they actually make a dustless saw with a vacuum and it doesn't sound like you could possibly collect all that dust but Hilti has figured out a way to do it with their vacuum and their saw and there's probably other companies that make it I just am familiar with Hilti so those would be your two options and other than either the wet saw which doesn't create dust or a dustless saw which collects it with a vacuum those are the only ones I know, and they do work pretty well. Is there going to be some dust? Maybe, but not as much as... When you see them outdoors, they're creating clouds of dust, but they're not concerned with it. Exactly. It's blowing across the woods and into the woods or wherever it's going. So uh, is there a way to do it? Yes, but you do need the right equipment. It's also good if you use like a shop vac and have one of those handy. I mean, you just have to, you know, really try to have that to catch as much dust as possible. Try to have that door or windows open with fans blowing everything out you possibly can. It'll still be a bit of a mess, but you just have to weigh that between that and being able to have the uh, convenience of one of those floor outlets. Oh, I just don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I know, it's a tough one. This whole project is just totally overwhelming. It's it's my living room, dining room, den, kitchen, that whole entire area. So everything has to be moved out, taken off the walls. It's overwhelming. Well, but, well, that's a lot to deal with, especially something that you had so nice and, and worked out so well. Hey, Linda, I just want to mention, if you really want floor outlets, obviously this is the time to do it. You're not going to ever do it again. Oh, you're right. I put two floor outlets in our family room, but it was a wood floor system, so it was pr- relatively easy to install. But the most important thing is know exactly where your furniture is going to be because you want the outlet ending up underneath your couch or too far away from your couch for a table lamp, something like that. But once you, I would certainly encourage you to do it. If you really like the idea of having, and definitely put at least two, I put two and it'd have been nice to have three because if it, if you don't use one, you know, at least it's still there in case you do sometime in the future, but I would encourage you to do it. This is the time. You're not going to get another chance. I know. I know. Uh, is there a place now or never? I know. Is there a place that rents? I was going to mention that you might look at all of the rental companies. Home Depot has a rental center, okay. and there's many other ones that are um, available. But I would just get online or you know, start calling around and just see if someone has one of these because you could rent that and then have the electrician use it. They are, are used to you know doing a lot of um, cutting and trenching like this and uh, probably end up to at least minimize that dust a little bit. Oh, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. And Joe, I love your simple solutions. Oh, thank you, Linda. I appreciate <laughs> Appreciate that. There are plenty more coming. I know. I just I go through them on the on the website. I uh, just I love it. I love it. Keep them coming. Thank you. I will. And if you ever come up with an idea of your own, let me know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. You take care. 
well, you know, that, I mean, her house was absolutely beautiful. And we, you know, if you wanted to see that show called Sheds for All Seasons, you can go to todayshomeowner.com and see what we did to a very modest little storage building and turn it into a little art studio while still having plenty of room for all her gardening that she does as well as storage. So that made for a really good show. That's great. Yeah, and we didn't get into it with her, but she had a plumbing leak. And that's why we we try to encourage people to be really aware of your mechanical systems. She had a plumbing leak that led to having to replace all the hardwood floors in her house. Yeah, I know it. That's that's wow. definitely unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, I hope her insurance is paying for this or Boy, that's really hard to hear. Yeah, it's an older house, so you never know what might have happened inside those walls. But, hey, coming up next is a simple solution. Joe, what about a quick little tease there on that? All right. It has the, it's a quick way to assemble furniture and other pieces that come with um, Allen come with set screws that you need an Allen wrench. It takes forever to keep turning an Allen. So I have a really quick way to assemble this furniture. Thank goodness. Those things can be so aggravating. I'm going to be even listening to this one. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. From installing a smart garage door opener, to installing a bathroom faucet, to removing a tree, the Home Depot believes you can do anything, especially the things we have how-to guides for. Visit homedepot.com for thousands of tips, workshops, and ideas for projects, big and small. The Home Depot app, how doers get more done. We often hear is how everybody loves the simple solution segment. Joe, what do you have for us? All right, Danny, assembling kit furniture and KD cabinets, which stands for knockdown cabinets, um, often requires the use of a hex key wrench. Most people know it as an Allen wrench, which is they're pretty effective, but they're painfully slow. It takes forever with this Allen wrench to tighten up. And it usually has dozens of these screws, right? They have to tighten up. So here's how to speed up the process. Take a hex key wrench and put it in a vise and clamp it down in a vise. Then cut off the shorter end of the wrench. The wrench is usually L-shaped, right? So you want to cut off the short leg of it. And you can use a hacksaw or I usually use a angle grinder with a cutting wheel in it. It takes like two seconds to cut through that hardened steel. But anyway, once you cut it off, you end up with just the long straight shaft of the wrench. Now you chuck it into your cordless drill and use that as a driver bit. Now, one thing I would recommend, because this furniture is a little, it's not like the most robust furniture. So crank down the um, torque setting on the drill to the lowest number, like one or two. And if it it winds up slipping and not driving it in, then you can tighten it a little bit. But you don't want to crank it up too much because you could drive this right, the screw right through the piece of wood. So be careful with that. Um, But it takes just seconds to drive these. So that that's my tip. And if and if you're concerned about overdriving them, you can use the drill to drive them almost all the way and then snug them up, get another Allen wrench and snug them up. But I found if you get the torque setting just right, you can get it perfect every time. And again, it only takes seconds. Well, that's a great simple solution and one that can save you a lot of time. I I know I've mentioned before about uh, my wife loves to put together things. Right. So I can like, you know, when when you have these things, it's inevitable, you know, that you've got to put together shelf sections or anything like that. Then I will take it out of the box, lay everything out for and turn her loose. And she just loves it. She'll put it together. <laughs> then all loose. I have to do is come back and do the torquing, torque it together like that. So, you know, and I bought her own set of tools and everything, Good. her own cordless drill. So I'll, next time I have that, I'll do this simple solution. Oh, good. Cut off the little hex wrench and uh, then I won't even have to do anything. I can go. That's right. Like drink tea or go fishing, one or the other. There you, you go. Know? Yeah. And I know how you'll present this to her. Hey, honey, I just came up with this great idea. If I take, <laughs> if I take your Allen wrench and cut the short leg off, I think you can put it in your drill. It just came to me. And the reason I'm doing this, dear, is because I want to make your life easy. Here. Here. Now I'm going to go fishing. Yeah. Here's a fresh battery if that battery runs low. <laughs> so, you know, that's just that's just the love that's in our house. I'll yeah, tell you right. that. Good though. for you. <laughs> Thanks so much for the wonderful reviews we continue getting. And we really appreciate you spending some time with us on the Today's Homeowner Podcast. I'm Danny Lipford, along with my buddy, Joe Truini.